Friends, I invite you once again to join with me in an attitude of prayer. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, may they be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Between 2016 and 2020, uh, The Good Place was on the television. Uh, it's, I'll be honest, one of my favorite shows. And it's a story about well, the good place. We might refer to it as heaven. And in the show, uh, this, in this universe, to get into the good place required that you had enough points. And every time you did something good, you'd score more positive points. And if you did something bad, then you'd get negative points. And then based on your total points at the end of your life might determine if you get into the good place. But then uh, later on in season four, they discover that there's a problem with the point system, that the point system is becoming more complicated, and, and they're having difficulties with that. And uh, what they're finding is that life is so much more complicated than anyone could imagine. And so many of the main characters are now standing before a judge and they're trying to make their argument that the point system is not working anymore. And Michael says, these days, just buying a tomato at the grocery store means that you are unwittingly supporting toxic pesticides, exploiting labor, contributing to global warming. Humans think that they're making one choice but they're actually making dozens of choices they don't even know that they're making. The judge doesn't buy, buy this argument, tells him, well, if you're buying a tomato, you should do more research <laughs> and face the consequences of your actions. And so then another character, Jason, he jumps up and he makes another argument. He says, I want to tell you about a guy from my dance crew in Jacksonville called Big Noodle. I used to yell at Big Noodle because he always showed up late to rehearsal. Then one day, the swamp under my house flooded. I needed a place to crash, so I slept at Big Noodle's house. Turns out, he had to juggle three jobs to take care of his four grandparents who all lived in the same bed, just like in Willy Wonka. <laughs> I never yelled at Big Noodle for being late after that because I knew how hard it was for him to be there, and he definitely didn't have time to research what tomatoes to buy. <laughs> Life can get complicated, can't it? And justice, for that matter, can be complicated. I remember years ago, there was a story that I heard about a patch of forest, and it was filled with songbirds, and so, uh, bird lovers loved that forest. But then apparently there were some people, I'm going to refrain from my judgmental comments at the moment, there were people who chose to abandon their pet cats there in that forest. And, well, you know, a cat's got to do what a cat's got to do, so the cats started eating the songbirds. And the bird lovers, those environmentalists, were not happy that their songbirds were getting eaten. So they set up some traps to catch the cats. Well, the cat people, the cat lovers found out about this. They were not happy at all. So the cat-loving environmentalists, they showed up to that same patch of forest to collect those cat traps. And I, I can just imagine in my head this big brawl between the bird environmentalists and the cat environmentalists all going at each other. Who was right? I, I don't know. Life gets complicated at times, doesn't it? Now, taking a little bit more serious of a turn, uh, not that environmental issues are not serious, but uh, I remember back in 2020, with a following George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, excuse me. And uh, that started up 
the defund the police movement, trying to address police violence and racism, which absolutely needed and still needs to continue to be addressed. And also, did defunding police departments and convincing people to not consider careers in law enforcement, did that make society better? Did it make people safer? Were people in poor communities better off from far fewer police presence? It's complicated. It's difficult to discern at times. Uh, I think about the uh, famous psychotherapist Edwin Friedman, who was known for saying, uh, people don't get the problems they can handle. Well, it actually is a truism, because if you could handle it, it wouldn't be a problem, right? And I believe the same is true for society. Society doesn't get the, pro the problems it can handle, uh, because if it's still a problem, if it's still plaguing society, if we're struggling through it, that means it's complicated. It's difficult to discern. And I'm not sure that we always recognize that complexity. Uh, so often I will witness an argument, and believe me, I participate in them too. I'm not free from this. But I hear so often we will say, well, this is what's right, and this is what's wrong. And of course, I'm right. That means everybody else is wrong. And we can so quickly move into labeling the others, can't we? They're ignorant. They're foolish. They just don't understand. They're selfish. They're wrong. Oh. But life can be complicated. Here's what I know is true. Now, I have worked as a pastor in four states. I kind of surprised myself. Uh, I've worked in Arizona, Illinois, Nevada, and now here in Texas. In every one of those states, I've served in churches and been a part of communities. And in each of those churches, each of those communities, I have met good people good people who want good things for themselves and good things for other people. People who want others to have nutritious food and clean water and safety and life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Everywhere I've been, I've met good people. I, is there anybody here who does not want others to have nutritious food, clean water, safety, life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness? Stand up. Which, anybody? Anybody? I was wondering to myself what I would do if somebody raised their hand or stood up. But, but I assure you, I have seen this at every church I've been to, in every community. Good people want others to thrive. And what I know to be true is that in this room right now and at home, surely, we have Democrats. We have Republicans, we have Libertarians, we have Independents, we have people who are just aren't sure yet, and probably others as well. All different people who are good and want good things for others. And so why? Why do we so easily get divided? Why do we so easily argue? Uh, there's many different theories about why it feels like it's developing more and more in our modern society, perhaps globalization, maybe the nature of uh, cable news networks, or is it social media? Uh, there's a variety of things. I believe all those cut down to a psychological concept called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias suggests that we will search out information that already matches what we already believe. Our opinions, our beliefs, we hold on to them, and then we just search out for that confirmation. But this is happening subconsciously. So it's not just that we search out information that confirms what we believe. 
we will also interpret information we receive based on our own opinions and beliefs, and we will even remember information that confirms our own opinions and beliefs more than we will remember other things. And what this means is that confirmation bias does not prove that we are right. It just makes us stubborn, <laughs> right? It makes us stubborn. And being stubborn uh, does not make us wiser or smarter or better. And that takes us into the scripture that we have for today. And I love this scripture because it's so uncomfortable. It's a difficult scripture. In our scripture lesson, we find Jesus who is, um, he is wanting to be alone. He does not want others to find him. Now, I think there's a little clue in that. And the clue is, well, when I think about myself, when I want to be alone, when I don't want other people to find me, I might be a little tired and grumpy, which raises a whole other theological question, does it? Doesn't it? Can, can Jesus be tired and grumpy? Can he get hangry, right? <laughs> Hungry and angry? Uh, uh, can Jesus have a bad day? May he need a little bit more rest, but then let's not forget that isn't it also God, the creator of the universe who created over six days and then took a day of rest. So I tend to think when I read this scripture, I imagine Jesus is a little tired and grumpy. <coughs> and in the midst of this, he wants to be alone and this woman, a Syrophoenician Gentile woman. Well, Syrophoenicia was a small region inside of the Middle East, so that's where she's from. That's, we could say, her ethnicity. And she's a Gentile, which means she is not Jewish, perhaps a kind of a racial term. She's a Syrophoenician Gentile coming to a Jewish Messiah. She seeks him out, and she finds him. And she she is, besides being Syrophoenician and Gentile, I think what probably defines her more important is that she is a loving mother. Her daughter is sick. We are told that she's been overwhelmed by a demon. And so she is seeking out Jesus, perhaps as her last expression of hope, her desire to see her child, her daughter, healed. And so she finds Jesus, she comes in, she begs him. And we would assume, I mean, it's Jesus after all, right? That Jesus would say, of course, she is healed. He doesn't say that. And it's shocking. He tells her this. He says, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. So, first of all, we recognize he's essentially saying no to a suffering woman. Well, already that's shocking. And then, uh, now, what's this metaphor Jesus is saying? So, he's saying, let the children be fed first. And we know that uh, Jesus, there's other places in the scriptures that reference that uh, the good news Jesus brought was to go to the Jewish people first, and then it would spread beyond to the Gentiles from there. So we can assume Jesus is referring to the children as the Jewish people, and then follows it up and says uh, that it's not fair to take the children's food. So we could interpret that the food is in reference to the grace and blessings of God. It's not fair to take the children's food and to throw it to the dogs. And so Jesus surely is referring to the dogs here as all the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, but he's also addressing it to her, right? It's not fair to take the children's th food and throw it to the dogs. He's essentially calling her a dog. Or in a more crass form, he calls her a I'm going to choose to keep my job today. <laughs> but you know where I was going, don't you? How awful could this possibly be? 
that he would say this to her? And it stirs within us the struggle of, this is Jesus. All kindness, all compassion, all love, all grace. A, how can he say no? And B, how can he be so offensive? But then, she does something unexpected. She doesn't, in hearing this insult, she doesn't run away, nor does she start screaming, yelling, trying to attack him. Instead, she kind of leans into the metaphor. She leans into Jesus, and she says, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She embraces this offensive metaphor, and she turns his words around as he would so often do with the other scribes and Pharisees and church leaders of the day. She turns his words around in a way that invites others to sympathize with her and to have compassion for her. And Jesus says, for saying that, your daughter has been healed. For saying that, your daughter has been healed. Which may still leave us with some questions from the Scripture. How could Jesus do this? It isn't holiness. Isn't Jesus to be perfectly, totally holy, righteous, good, And wouldn't perfect holiness mean that Jesus would never make a mistake, never do something so unjust as, really, could we say, being prejudicial against her? But what if holiness is not about perfection? What if holiness is not about being right? What if holiness is about being open to letting someone else critique us? What if holiness is about the willingness to let someone else critique us? I believe Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to this as well when he wrote from his letter from a Birmingham jail He said this, in no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law, as would the rabid segregationist. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its, it, over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. The call to do what we are called to do. The call to speak out against injustice. The call to fight back against what's wrong in the world and be open to accountability. Be open to consequences. Be open to the criticism and the correction of others. We are looking at our proposed mission statement, and we're going to present it before church council on the 25th. We've been receiving responses already. If you have a comment and you want to share that, our mission vision strategy team, right, Brian, is going to get together this week. We're going to review those comments, and so if you have comments you want to make, send them in to me. I'll gather them together, make sure the committee knows about all of them. And part of That mission statement is to create space for justice. And what does all of this mean to us as we try to create space 
for justice. I believe the first thing that it calls us to do is to be open to each other and open to the conversation that we can have our positions, our beliefs, our values, but to be in conversation with those who disagree with us, lovingly sharing with each other and helping to grow in understanding. We can create space for justice by being open to each other. We can create space for justice by fully participating in our civic duties, which means not just participating here at First Church, but also voting, serving on a jury when we are called, and being as informed as we're capable of being. Uh, not that we all have to agree, not that we all have to vote in the same way, not that you have to vote as I do or vice versa, but that we are all participating. And we can create space for justice by acting as a body, as a church, to move on efforts to make wrongs into rights, and to improve the world, to make changes. Now, that is not to say that when we as a church choose an action to take as a body, that it suggests that if you don't agree, well, it's this way or the highway. No, not at all. Because if you disagree, your voice becomes even that much more important. That we can, even as we are moving in action to correct, correct injustices, that we be open to the conversation, open to listening, open to hearing each other, because that is our opportunity as a church to be the presence of Jesus for each other. Or maybe we can be the presence of the Syrophoenician Gentile woman for each other to challenge each other and say, look, I know that you are convicted, but consider the complexity. Consider the other opportunities. Consider a wider perspective that all of us may continue to grow in faithfulness, in hope, and injustice. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, we come before you struggling in the world that is so complex and can be so difficult and so frustrating at times. And in the midst of all of this confusion, help us to love, to hold the hands of our neighbors, to witness to each other's faith, and at times to speak truth, perspective, opportunity, that all of us may continue to grow in you. Draw us into your holiness, almighty God. In your name we pray. Amen.